In this video, I would like to walk you through some basic concepts behind high-resolution transmission spectroscopy of hot Jupiter atmospheres and the cross-correlation technique that is used to find signals of atomic and molecular species. This technique is applicable to transmission as well as emission spectroscopy, but I will only focus on transmission for the purpose of simplicity. Imagine a planet being in transit, meaning in between the star and the observer far away. Some starlight will fall onto the planet and be scattered or absorbed on the planet's illuminated day side. Most starlight will not hit the planet at all and will pass unhindered on its way towards Earth. But only a very small fraction of light will pass right through the upper layers of the atmosphere. Here, it can be absorbed by atoms or molecules or be scattered depending on whether there are clouds or aerosol particles. These effects together create the transmission spectrum. This filtering of starlight happens all across the day to night side terminator and only at relatively high altitudes because the atmosphere becomes opaque very quickly for rays that pass through the deeper layers because of the slanted incident angle. The transmission spectrum is therefore formed at a very specific region of the planet's global atmosphere. In theory, the resulting transmission spectrum of a typical hot Jupiter may look like this at optical wavelengths. There may be bands by absorbing molecules, such as water or titanium and vanadium oxides. There may be line opacity by atoms, such as the strong sodium doublet, or heavier metals. And also there may be a sloped continuum due to scattering. The y-axis shows the depth of absorption of the atmosphere relative to the flux of the star when the planet is not positioned in front. The atmosphere may be responsible for some tenths of percents of absorption, depending on wavelength. The signatures we are aiming at are therefore very small compared to the spectral lines in the star. On top of that, the opaque disk of the planet causes additional absorption of approximately a percent if it's a hot Jupiter around a sun-like star. This is what's called the gray absorption that is present at all wavelengths and is not included in this graph. To be able to discern the transmission spectrum, we make use of a time differential measurement where we take a time series of observations over the course of a transit event and compare the spectrum of the entire system before and after the transit with the spectrum observed during transit. If the star, the instrument, and the observing conditions are stable, a transmission spectrum may look like the model shown here. If the spectrum is observed at a low spectral resolution, such as plotted with the black squares, the individual lines cannot be observed, but their integrated effect can be measured. A spectrograph with sufficient resolving power will be needed to discern the individual lines. We define the spectral resolution R of a spectrum as the wavelength over the minimum wavelength difference that can be resolved at that wavelength. This can be expressed in terms of the Doppler effect as the speed of light over the smallest Doppler velocity that can be resolved. Typical high resolution spectrographs have resolutions of around 100,000 which means that they can resolve motions on the order of a few kilometers per second, much smaller than the typical orbital velocity of a close-in planet. If the planet is sufficiently close-in, the radial component of this orbital velocity can vary between the start and the end of the transit event. A typical hot Jupiter may have an orbital velocity in excess of 100 kilometers per second, and the radial component may vary by tens of kilometers per second during the transit. At the same time, lines of the star and the Earth's atmosphere are more or less stationary, which means that this behavior can be used to further discern the signal of the planet from other noise sources. It may also be used to directly measure the orbital velocity of the planet, which yields a gravitational measurement of the mass of the star, in much the same way as is done for spectroscopic binary stars. A final advantage of high-resolution spectrographs is that atmospheric wind speeds from the day to the night side of a hot Jupiter may well be in excess of a few kilometers per second, meaning that such instruments have the capacity to constrain atmospheric dynamics as well. By definition, a high-resolution spectrograph disperses light across a large number of detector pixels. This means that the flux that is registered by the instrument per unit of wavelength is much lower than for a lower-resolution spectrograph on a telescope of the same size. As a result, 
the photon noise of the star will almost always greatly exceed the signal of the planet at any given wavelength, even after combining many in-transit spectra and multiple transit events. A planet's transmission spectrum may have many spectral lines, but most of these will not be observable at the signal-to-noise level reached using typical observations. To still be able to detect faint spectral lines in the planet's atmosphere, we make use of the cross-correlation technique. This technique uses the fact that we know precisely at what wavelengths certain lines are formed. By selecting and averaging sufficient spectral lines, we are able to average out the photon noise to yield a measurement of some average spectral line. This takes the following mathematical form. Imagine that the spectrum is described as n discrete flux measurements corresponding to different wavelengths, denoted by xi. We wish to average x for all values of i that are inside spectral lines of interest. We achieve this by multiplying x with a template or mask. This template takes on non-zero values inside a spectral line, but is zero in between the lines. If t sums up to a value of 1, this operation is identical to nothing more than a weighted average over the spectral pixels xi. There are similar mathematical implementations in use in the literature, but in one way or another they all rely on averaging many spectral lines to effectively reduce the noise in the measurement. Although we know the relative positions of all of the planet spectral lines given by quantum mechanics, we may not know the instantaneous Doppler shift of the entire spectrum. So we compute this average over a range of Doppler shifts applied to the template, making the template dependent on radial velocity. In this way, we construct what's known as a cross-correlation function shown in the following animation. In blue is shown a noisy transmission spectrum of a planet atmosphere that contains gaseous iron. The template is a model spectrum of iron and the cross-correlation function is evaluated for consecutive shifts of this template. The x-axis of the cross-correlation function is therefore radial velocity and the y-axis denotes the average line depth. At the correct radial velocity, when the template is exactly aligned with the planet, meaning that it has the same Doppler shift, the cross-correlation function will maximize. Even though the individual absorption lines of iron may be drowned out in the photon noise of the star, if these lines are plentiful, the noise in the cross-correlation function will be greatly reduced, allowing us to confidently confirm that iron is present in the atmosphere of this planet. The real observed transmission spectrum in this case is continuum subtracted. That's why the cross-correlation function is nearly zero when the template is shifted away from the rest frame velocity of the planet. Often, the data is first continuum subtracted using some form of averaging filter, in which case the average of the cross-correlation function will indeed approach zero. Typically, this cross-correlation function will be computed for every spectrum obtained during the time series. Because the radial velocity of the planet changes over the course of the transit, the peak location of the cross-correlation function will shift accordingly. We can therefore construct the cross-correlation function along two dimensions, where the horizontal direction is the radial velocity and the vertical direction is the time series. The changing radial velocity of the planet results in a slanted feature, and the angle of this feature is directly proportional to the physical orbital velocity of the planet times the sine of the inclination, which is close to 1 because the planet is transiting. The signal you see here is an exaggeration. Most of the time, the strength of the cross-correlation signal is much weaker, meaning that we need to average over the time series to make the absorption visible. To do this, we would need to know the Doppler shift of the cross-correlation function through time a priori. If we don't know the stellar mass accurately, or if the planet is not transiting, we don't know this. Nonetheless, we can average over the in-transit exposures, assuming a range of possible orbital velocities as shown in the following animation. We assume a sequence of possible values of the orbital velocity and shift the spectra to the corresponding rest frames. In this way, we construct a velocity-velocity diagram composed of different realizations of the one-dimensional time-averaged cross-correlation function.
At the correct orbital velocity, the signal of the planet adds constructively and the time average cross-correlation function maximizes. This concept was first applied by Matteo Brogi in 2012 to determine the orbital velocity and hence the inclination of the non-transiting planet Tau Bootes b using carbon monoxide absorption lines in its day-side emission spectrum. This is a cross-correlation function of a single cross-correlation template designed to detect a single species, in this case carbon monoxide. But we can construct a template for each species of interest and do a survey, as it were, of the planet's transmission spectrum. Successful examples of this, in work of me and my collaborators, are detections of various species in the transmission spectra of kelp mine B and WASP 1 to 1 B, such as magnesium, calcium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, iron, nickel, and others. For more in depth explanations, these are several papers that describe various discoveries and implementations of the method in more detail. Also, please feel free to get in touch if you would like to know more.